this new drug may cure cancer. Just re- in your mind, just replace it with may not cure cancer <laughs> because that is what may means, right? Yeah. It's may or may not. It could, but also it, yeah. it might not. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 430 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth, and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, and I'm the miscellaneous programmer. I'm Sam, and I'm the artiste. And this is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today's August 24th, 20 Jubilee. Before we get started, we do have a warning. There's going to be profanity in this show. And we'd also like to thank our recurring supporters over at moneygrab.bscotch.net, whose uh, monthly donations help keep this podcast going. So thank you very much for that. All right, you guys. Hmm. Welcome to the Heat Dome. (laughs) I too true. Uh, what was it to, uh, Monday? Monday, I got up to drop the dogs off at the do- at the dog daycare. They go a few times a week so that you know they're tired because a tired dog is a good dog, true, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it was so humid that the f- forecast just said fog, but like it wasn't fog. You know what I mean? It was, <laughs> it just, was like a misted. It was just ninety-two percent humidity, Jeez. and you just had like a thousand feet of visibility. Like it was weird because I, like I, you know, I've been in fog, and this was something else. Yeah, I, I mean, like, fog it was, it's hard to just, describe. Yeah, <laughs> fog is just a cloud on the ground. You know, right? this is just this, this is just, was just all of. There was no place for a cloud to go no. because the whole air everywhere was cloud. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like. Yeah. It was fucked. Uh, so I – and it was only like 85 degrees, which was – I mean, it's still hot for like that early in the morning. But, uh, uh, man, when it's that humid, you it just – feels gross, man. Oh. Step outside, you're like, got to shower again. It was it was even to the point where like I thought it had – I thought it had rained because there were certain like areas like around my house where it was just wet because like mm-hmm. the humidity had – you know, Clung like condensed on fall. the side of the house and then run down the house. Like all the windows were wet, you know, but like Whoa. the ground was dry, you know, anywhere that the sun was hitting. Cause it, you know, it was just, oh, that was, that was the muggiest day I've ever experienced. Yeah. Yeah. It was, this whole week is like a hundred degrees. This whole week is, yeah. Yeah. I have this to, whole week. Right after this yeah. podcast, I have to go pick up my car from the shop and I'm just like dreading walking out the door to do it because you know, even even this like this morning we checked it was because it's already like 80 something degrees and it already feels like you know feels like 98 or whatever right yeah and it's a high it's a high like on the thermometer of 100 or 103 or something like that uh but but i actually noticed that they don't i could actually at least like the google weather stuff they don't they don't have they tell you like right now what it feels like but they don't project out what it's gonna feel like they just mm. tell you how hot like the thermometer temperature is yeah so i don't know exactly what that heat index i mean we're, we're under a heat index advisory you know for the mm. rest of the week basically uh it's just and this is like this isn't even close to the worst in the country right now you know like it's crazy. Dude. Yeah. It is probably some of the more humid uh, areas right around oh, us. But, well, yeah. you can't get much more humid. Than yeah. That. No, no, I mean, honestly, though, humidity is great because it's the only thing keeping everything from bursting into flames. Yeah, <laughs> like if everything, is, if everything is a little bit damp, then it's harder for fires to consume mm-hmm. everything, which is what's happening everywhere else that That's isn't true. as humid. So, um, you know, fuck. Anyways, let's get on <laughs> to some questions. Uh, these yes. questions come from our listeners over at podcast.bscotch.net. Highest upvoted question comes from Glorious Cashew, who says, Whenever I have to come up with gibberish on the spot, which is fairly often, I completely blank. Wait, Butterscotch why? games. <laughs> well, we'll, well, well, we'll get to that. Butterscotch games are exactly 72% gibberish. Mm-hmm. How do you come up with all these funny sounding names? Mm. I think uh, part of it is we do that kind of, uh, what do you call it? It's a vocal stimming or whatever. It's called ADHD, it's a, you know. It's, yeah, that's basically what it is. But it's <laughs> it's the root source. The, this will happen just very frequently where someone will say something and then another person just sort of changes the emphasis of the syllables. Just you bend it a bit, you know. And then, just for just because that's sort of what your brain's doing right now, I guess. And then I think that same thing just kind of happens with just yeah. everything. Yeah, we'll, we'll have like an item in the game and it'll have some name and then, you know, we all, um, it, most of us who are working on the game have the ability to like change tool tips or change names of things or whatever. Um, and yeah, sometimes you'll see something and you'll just be like, mm, I'm bored reading the name of this. Like, mm-hmm. it's just not exciting or funny enough. And then <laughs> just, 
just start messing around with it. Of course, we always review it and make sure that, hey, I, I want to change the name of this to something. Because, of course, changing the name of something is kind of cascading downstream effects. Like if a quest talks about it or or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a – we're just easily bored even just reading single words. <laughs> and, 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 and we've got to change it. Yeah, because I will say, or, uh, like, it's, it's usually kind of chaotic up front, like from this idea of, like, it's kind of gibberish at the outset, at least a little bit. But it is the – case it's mostly just being exposed to multiple people over time who mm-hmm. who all sort of treat it the same way and so as i said like it's less that, it, that we come up with these things on the spot though that we do we start somewhere for all these things too right but but it's more that they just have a lot of time to have bored adhd driven brains yeah um, yeah and you think what's what's interesting with uh, work with the game changer now is because we can actually spec out content in like a skeletonized fashion really really quickly that the really dumb naming stuff doesn't happen until a little bit later typically because we're essentially just scaffolding things and you don't you also don't know if we don't have art or whatever else we haven't necessarily done the abilities for like a particular weapon or whatever so it's like d- dagger level three is currently you know like one of the things because yeah. we haven't gotten to a point where there's enough information to actually make some dub names, right? But as soon as, especially as soon as there's a picture involved, then it's like, it's sort of one of those like, what does it look like? What's it, what's it doing? And then it's just some of this kind of stupid. It's usually a, a portmanteau or something at that yeah. point where we like, we'll take the name of the thing. So if it's like pants, mm-hmm. but like, you know, but then if it's made out of like some kind of a, jewel or something we mm-hmm. might call them like sparkling jants mm-hmm. or, or some dumb crap like that because yep. it's like yeah just take the take the two words and just start mixing the letters yeah, together that is the easiest way i think to to come up with a lot from just that what this person is describing as gibberish which I, which i think of as like completely uncom- incomprehensible right but but it sounds like what they mean is just like kind of made up words right yeah. um yeah uh, We're basically the Jort Studio. Yeah, it's, it's just, all portmanteau is the yeah. root, the root source, and that's I think that's just a good way to start. As from a your creative gibberish experience, you know, is mm-hmm. is it's the easiest way, but it's also the most understandable for your audience, right? Because if they read a thing that's really that's not a word, but in context, because they're looking at a picture of something or uh, or what other context clues, right? are already strongly hinting at what it is, and then it's just a portmanteau of those things, then people can grok it, usually on first read, actually, which is yeah. the best of all worlds, you know? It's yeah, Unlike well, some of those made-up names you read in, like, fantasy or, like, some sci-fi stuff, you know? Yeah, where, they just completely where, bounce off the folds of your brain. Oh, my God, yeah. There. There's, there's, yeah. There's, a few, there's a few series that I've read where, by the end of it, there were still people's names and... And like other names of things <laughs> in the world that I couldn't, the moment I stopped looking at the page, I couldn't tell you what those names were, yeah. you know, like. I think it's even. when they, when they go out of being in uh, basically a descriptive capacity for the thing and being a, like a, like a last name equivalent where you, it could be any combination of letters from any language, essentially, then it gets really hard to track all that stuff. I think one of the, my favorite ones, though, that I know Seth put it recently because it because it took me a sec. So because I think there's a mm, you want things one, to be yeah. yeah you want things to be read on first on first read for the most part, but also if something can have a name <laughs> that you don't quite grok as a joke until a little bit later, it's sometimes even better as long as it's basically like a, it becomes a, a long form little comedy bit, right? So mm-hmm. we have this uh, this trinket called which was originally just called the conduit. Okay, we just named it based on what it did, which is it does some stuff with electricity for you. And then Seth had changed it to you conduit, um, which I just read. Like, and just like I, the letter U dash conduit, right? Because it's kind of U shaped. Yeah. Yep. You know. um, well, that's actually because we just Seth stubbed in a magnet icon yeah. for it. So again, here's this whole like, here's where we'll go. Here's how this works. <laughs> and then, um, and I read that and I was like, okay, I mean, I guess it's kind of like magnet based, whatever. And then I read the tooltip that Seth said something along the lines of just holding this makes you feel like you can do anything. And I suddenly realized that he riffed off of you can do it as you can do it. <laughs> you can, you like, can do it. <laughs> and then the whole thing was just hilarious. And so I think that's that's kind and of now like works. now that name isn't allowed to change. Right. And so, so now like the art and the story and whatever, we'll just like, we'll just work that around that joke because the joke is too good to get rid of, even though the joke just comes from a tooltip actually. Right. Yeah. 
It's kind of like, I mean, we talked about this story a lot in the past too with like the bacon weed fairy in original Crashlands where- Oh yeah, we just kept riffing on that and it just kept getting- <laughs> Yeah, it just kept getting more out of, out of hand <laughs> and then it turned into this whole like ridiculous boss fight storyline sequence, right? Um, with this just bizarro boss, right? <laughs> and it all stemmed from just like a little one-off joke in the tooltip to the big, to the potted bacon weed um, item, yep. right? And so that's where just a lot of this comes from. It's just the it's just the flexibility of kind of allowing for placeholders because we just need placeholders to go in, mm-hmm. and everybody gets bored looking at boring stuff. So like the placeholders are kind of usually already a little bit interesting, but also because they're placeholders, they, it doesn't feel like you have to do it right or like mm-hmm. yeah, you just jam something in there. You just do something, and so like yeah. you just kind of you just do something that seems fun in the moment, and then allow other people to riff on it over time and eventually it solidifies into something. Yeah. Yeah. We've got stuff like we have a, a pick, a mining pick in crashes two that uses a, uses teeth as one as one of its components. So it's a toothpick. I mean, obviously it's a toothpick. Yeah. Yeah. We got, we got all kinds of things that are, sometimes we'll have things that are named the same as some real world counterpart, but with a completely different, you know, rationale behind it. And then it totally changes the meaning of the item. But yeah, I mean, it's just, like I've said, it's just about, we get bored and we iterate a lot. Yeah. But so, it's also, you know, it's embracing happen. dumb humor is part of it too. So it's oh, actually one of the things that, so Jen, who does all of our, does like the story writing and stuff, right? Um, it's one of the things that, that, I, that I've noticed in the chat when she's asking about like, okay, I'm trying to do this, but like, is this the right kind of dumb is the question that she wants <laughs> to ask, right? And it's just this embracing of like, there's a particular, there's just a particular level of like kind of, it's just dad joke is kind of like the level yeah, we're operating at, you know? Jokes, yep. And and that also gives you a lot of flexibility because it doesn't have to be like a smart joke. It doesn't have to be a good joke. It doesn't have to be a new joke, right? It's just like taking the joke and putting it into this context, right? Uh, and and part of like the almost there's almost a competition about just how dumb mm-hmm. we can get before it's too dumb and we have to pull it back, right? And having it having that be the goal of just like what's just the dumbest thing we could do here right makes it so that you can just have fun without really worrying about if it's good because if its point is to be dumb and not specifically to be good a lot of <laughs> a lot of pressure goes away right and, and well, then it, you can create good, good space stuff. for creativity yeah. yeah exactly you can create good stuff by focusing on dumbness actually because yeah it just it just reduces the pressure of having mm-hmm. to be good yeah, it really is the dad joke method of game development, which is a dad joke is a joke where the the dad finds it funny and he and and he tells it without regard of whether anybody else actually yep. gives a shit about yep. how funny it is, yep. right? So you could tell like the dad is cracking himself up and he's having a great time. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. And so like <laughs> if you're playing a game and it feels like the people making it were having a great time making it, I feel like that's a that, good thing. Yeah, vibe, absolutely. Right? That, like, just, that just rubs <laughs> off on it. Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not all the things actually land or make people chuckle, whatever. Like but you could tell that people are having fun making it. Which but matters. also we have to make like, I don't know how many items are in the game already in tools, hips. We have to make thousands. And we thousands have to make, because so, we, like, we try to put so jokes many. into basically like every little block of text you see, right? There's like, or, or trying to, because like we're trying to convey the humor of, of in the vibe of the game in every single block of text. So we have thousands of opportunities, which is also means thou- thousands of times you have to, you have to like come up with something, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's the other part of it too, is like the, they can be duds 80% of the time. For eighty percent of the audience, as long as like there's a constant stream of sensible chuckles, you know, as you're yep. as you're experiencing the game. Yeah, yeah. I also I love my my two kind of like favorite uh, jokes that we can do in in tooltips are basically ones where like well it's it's kind of it's kind of two variations of the same thing, but it's basically where you start describing the thing in a very normal way. Yeah, and then and then it totally pivots at the end in a different direction. It gets unhinged. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, or or it could, it could be stuff like, you know, oh, when you touch this, it burns your finger at first. But when you touch it again, it burns your finger again. <laughs> it's like it's like a Mitch Hedberg style, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just that kind of like subvert, subverting expectations, right? Uh, all right. Next question comes from Gabe, who says, update us on your consumptions. What's something you've been reading lately? You mean the tuberculosis? We don't have tuberculosis. <laughs> What's something you've been reading lately? What's a cocktail or drink of any sort you've enjoyed lately? And if you partake, what's something you've smoked and enjoyed? Mm. Or equivalent? 
Uh, I've got I answers to all these. Just read the Scholomance book. Oh, series. that was fun! So fun. Did you Such did you read the whole series time. or the just the I first did, book? All three of them. Yeah, was, yeah. Boom. yeah, I love it. Basically, it was the first time in a while that I sort of uncontrollably was just up until until I was done. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So yep. Yep. Uh, that, that series did the same thing to me. Yeah, very very fun. Uh, I think the first one's called A Deadly Education. I'm not going to say much about it except it's really good. If you like, if you like. Uh, I guess sort of, you know, Hogwartsy in terms of, uh, you know, wizard school, but a very it's dark, gruesome version yeah. of it. It's just really fun. Lots of people die, I guess, is the short, just all the time, constantly. Mm-hmm. It's great. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. In horrendous that, ways. That doesn't sound great. But it's that not, but it's not like, not in the way of like Game of Thrones, though. It's more like, because uh, like, yeah, it's kind of indiscreet. It's like fit, fits, it threads a, a needle space that I'm not, that doesn't really exist in other. It's. It's somehow Sorry, exceptionally never... morbid, and but also delightful. Flippant. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so kind of like uh, one of my new favorite shows, the Harley Quinn cartoon. On there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On. Less less on like the dumb jokey side though, which is where Harley Quinn kind of falls. But yeah. But yeah. The, but it's but still but a similar it's an incredibly vibe, yeah. It's a very violent yeah cartoon, mm-hmm. but it's all like uh you know there's an undercurrent of comedy, so it's kind of you know. It, you can have entire cities being destroyed as long as there's enough jokes being yep, said. Hundred percent. You know. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But okay. I would say I would. I think I would describe it as like there's the kind of the core premise of like the like the main character is basically an evil sorceress, right? Mm-hmm. But she's trying not to be. But she has like basically access to unlimited evil power, right? Mm-hmm. And she's just mm-hmm. trying to go about her life and not do evil things, right? Uh, and that's kind of like how the thing starts. It's right? a hilarious shtick, like every yeah. line. For yeah, so the, things just keep on happening where she's like, she realizes, oh no, if I like tap into this, I could like destroy the world with it with an infinite volcano or whatever, right? Um, or she like she asks the school gives you spells if you ask it for stuff, and right? So and it only asks, gives her the most evil of spells. Yeah, yeah. she <laughs> asks for like a cleaning spell, and it gives her like a way to just sort of purge the entire like the entire surroundings earth. four square miles <laughs> with fire. You know, like that's. Yeah. Right. We'll it will be clean, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It won't exist anymore, which yeah. is the cleanest something can be. Yeah, it's yeah. very. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I just be eating peanut butter and Nutella. You know what I mean? Just, just straight out the jar. Just yeah. boom, spoon one, spoon the other in your mouth. So good. What's that? Slam it, slam it. Those are my two consumes. <laughs> Nutella was under a lawsuit back. I think it was maybe like ten years ago or something because they were advertising in Europe about how like Nutella was. They did that thing where it was like part of a complete breakfast. Right. Oh yeah. Oh. Like <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll show they'll show like a legit actual breakfast, which is that's the complete breakfast, and then there'll yeah. be Nutella next to it, and like, look, it's it's part of this. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so people sued, saying like, this is being advertised as a healthy food, um, which it's an even bigger sh- <laughs> yeah, it's an even bigger stretch than cereal making that claim, which is all yep. like cereal is just candy, right? Yeah. Nutella <laughs> is obviously it's, chocolate and. <laughs> it's just chocolate, yeah. right? Like yeah, yeah. too hard to sell that lie. <laughs> yep, yep. But they won. I'm pretty sure they won that lawsuit because you know they did. In fact, clearly frame it as a viable, just healthy a part. Yeah, just a part. Yeah. Part of a balanced, complete breakfast. Yeah, it's, it, this it's is the, the part, unbalanced part. But it's, it's the bad part, and then there's a good part, and then it, you have balance. Yeah, it's the part that balances it out. That's great. Uh, okay. Yeah. So what else? What else? You guys been partaking in? Uh, so or I've books, got. Fred? So I, so on the on the book side, I kind of used up all the like the stuff that I really liked a while ago. So I've I haven't found a good. I'm the the next uh, Murderbot book comes out in like a month or two or something. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that one. And Ooh. and I read uh, Kaiju Preservation Society recently, which was a pretty fun. Hmm. It's kind of a light. I don't know. I think it's like, I don't even know how, do I, how I would describe it. It's like just, it's like a dumb action movie. It's kind of what it feels like, right? So like, it's a it's a good time to to read it, but like, you're not going to walk away being like, that was the best book I've ever read or anything like that, you know, but it's very fun. Um, but in terms of other things, so I, I got a juicer a little while ago. It's the, uh, it's the ninja, uh, what is it called? It's like the ninja, like no clog or some dumb name but uh, i was looking for something that's that's pretty quiet because i had a juicer in the past and it was fucking like it was just like it, it would roar back. and it would it would throw debris around while it was doing stuff you know? so i was like <laughs> wait wait I wait get- are you sure that wasn't a chimpanzee that was, yeah, that was an animal that was a it, wild yeah. animal you brought your head. it was shit on everything i had to feed it non-stop <laughs> yeah i mean and they do kind of shit on the other side you know uh, yeah 
<laughs> all the pulp and stuff. <laughs> But it was like it was still it was pretty fun to to have though. It was just like that that machine was this big clunky thing again, really loud and messy. Um, so we got rid of it a long time ago. But then recently, I wanted to juice some stuff, and I was like, oh, let me look look let me get just, just get a decent, reasonably priced, smallest juicer, you know that that doesn't do all that stuff. So this thing fit the bill, and it is great. It like works really really well. Um, pretty easy to clean. Not too loud unless you get something squeaky in there that it kind of makes horrible <laughs> like squeaking noises, you know. But what? Like, cause, cause like stuff, <laughs> stuff can like rub up against the sides, you know? So like, so but what's, what's squeaky? Like apples, apples were, were, in particular were very apples. squeaky, yeah. which I don't like. Do you apples think anyway, do you so. think they're naturally squeaky or is it because they have wax on the, uh, Oh, so that was the question that we had. So I, so then I cut the skin off for the next <laughs> round and it was still very squeaky. Mm-hmm. So there's something about okay. the, the juice in there. I don't know. I get that. I can understand. I feel like when you eat an apple, you got that. It's got a squeakiness. Like a, yeah, it's got a squeakiness to it. Yeah. So that shows up in the juicer too, apparently. Um, but but what we so so we had this like giant, we had gone to Costco, we had this giant thing of ginger. This just fucking enormous, like Costco scale ginger tub, you know. And it was sitting in our fridge for a while, and I had just gotten this juicer and I was like, we gotta do something with this yeah, ginger. It's just a lifetime supply of ginger if you're Yeah, so I was like, Costco I'm just gonna thing. juice it. And so I just peeled all the skin off and then just juiced all of it. It was like a, it came out to like a, I don't know. It was, it, it was like a couple cut. It was like a pint probably of, of just ginger, just unadulterated Whoa. ginger juice. Right. <laughs> and, and I, and I just like tasted it just to see what it was like. And I just like, and I started coughing cause it was just like, yeah, ginger well, <laughs> just fire. Fire. yeah. and I was like, okay, I gotta, I was like, this is a, what? this is very intense, but like my wife absolutely loves ginger and I'm, I'm a fan yeah, of it, but not, not the same, you know, extent. And, uh, and so I was like, okay, because we usually make uh, ginger syrup for our cocktails. And to do that, we usually just like take some ginger, cut it up, and then we just boil it with our simple syrup, right? And simple syrup is just one part water to one part sugar. That's it. And you just dissolve it. So you just boil it until the sugar dissolves. Now you got a simple syrup and you can use that for cocktails. Um, but then we, you just, we, it's fun to flavor it with stuff, right? So we make like mm-hmm. rosemary simple syrup, blah, blah, blah. But ginger is, is one of those staples because it's just like a – it's just a good flavor and it also cuts through everything, right? So it makes for a great cocktail syrup. So usually when we do it though, it's just like a nice like gingery kind of a thing, right? But this time I was like, let's just use this ginger juice. Uh, and then and, – and so then my wife was like getting ready to make it and she was like, how much of this should I use? And I was like, probably – I don't know, not that much because like that's potent. She was like, I'm just going to use all of it. <laughs> So, <laughs> so she basically replaced the water portion of like the simple syrup with just this fucking just just raw ginger, raw ginger. Uh, and and it turned out to be I mean very powerful but also truly amazing like it's just hmm. it's just like punch you in the face ginger but like because there's so much sugar in there that it's like a it's a candy ginger kind of experience you know mm-hmm. and in cocktails it turned out to be like just truly amazing because assuming you like ginger flavored stuff because that you're not hiding that ginger you know, taste in your in your cocktail. Yeah, that's, it's coming to the forefront I yeah imagine. but because it just cuts through absolutely everything you just you don't need very much of it and you can just put it in any like anything and it just makes it like you can just take a, a just a raw booze you can make like an, an old fashioned which is just which is just whiskey plus a little bit of sugar right or simple syrup it's just like mm. an old fashioned, like all of a sudden that, that whiskey, which even with a little bit of sugar, usually still is going to, yeah. yeah. All of a sudden it's just like this delicious, amazing, mm. like candy ginger experience. So, so you guys got to start bottling up this punch you in the face, ginger syrup yeah. and yeah. Uh, <laughs> sell that for 15 so. bucks a, a vial or mm. what? I mean, yeah, you, you could like, and it's just so, like my wife puts it in like all of her tea, you know, and, and so mm-hmm. it's, we just, we just mm. made a fresh batch this weekend. Uh, so that if, I mean, to, to really do it though. So, so I'll say before you don't need to get a juicer to make a good ginger syrup because you can just get some ginger, boil some water and some sugar, you know, and then just kind of, kind of just crush it up a bit and throw it in there in thin slices and let it boil for a bit and you'll get a really pleasant ginger syrup. So that's a, that's a good move right there. But if you want to go all in. Get yourself uh-huh. a juicer and just if fucking, you want to go industrial. Yeah, go to town on this stuff. It's it is pretty amazing. Do you find yourself are you going through just like mountains of produce? Uh, I, juicer? I definitely would be if we were like consistently juice. And I, those things like as I knew because I, I went into like a really brief hyperfixation on on like juices. <laughs> it's like things, right? Uh, why was I was because I wanted because I was because I was making coffee drinks 
I was making a, what do you call it? A coffee tonics. Right. Mm, yeah, and I kept on, I kept on buying this fancy tonic and I was like, how do you make tonic? You know, so like I read about how to do that. And I was like, ooh, so I ordered all the stuff to make my own tonic. Oh. And while I was at it, and then my wife had just gotten this book um, called Zero, which is just like one of those like big fancy uh, recipe books, you know, but it's, it's from, from some like highfalutin restaurant, mm -hmm. but it's called Zero because it's zero proof drinks right so it's like cocktails oh, but without the cocktails cocktail, you know? yeah it's just all or, cocktails. I guess, weird drinks as we call them it's weird drinks mm -hmm. but like fancy right so yeah. like mm -hmm. like the kind of stuff you're gonna pay 20 dollars for at some fancy restaurant right mm -hmm. and it had all these like weird ingredients and things i didn't know it was like vegetable glycerin was like a core staple of things like i so i just ordered so i just like ordered a whole bunch of this stuff just to like play with it you know and I knew like that hyperfixation was going to go away pretty fast, but I was like, let me just get the things as quickly as I can so I can do some of this yeah, before. Through it. Before, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, by the by the time that they arrive, I'll still be interested. Yeah, <laughs> which, which worked out for the most part. Um, but with the juicer part, I was like, just every once in a while, it's nice to be able to just like get juice out of something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was part yeah, of like, I, was, I don't want to chew this. I want to drink this. So that's yeah, part of my motivation for like, what's the thing that I can find that will outlive the hyperfixation where I can just... It'll fit on the counter somewhere, and then I can periodically, easily, and quickly just like juice something without it being a big deal. And so that was kind of the approach that I went. You know, I that, that stuff shocked. used up produce fast, though. Yeah, I was and, shocked because we get we used to have one of those hand clamp juicer things that you'd like put a oh for lemons and limes. Yeah, you like slice a, a lemon or a lime in half, and then you put it in a little cup and sort of just it like yeah squeeze the handle and it sort of smooshes it. And I was doing it by hand before, and my wife got one of those because I would just sit there and just like just maul this lemon, right? <laughs> and so I just wanted to see like what the comparison was using that tool versus a hand. And the amount of extra juice that came out of that fucking yeah. piece of shit, I was one. like, I've been leaving gallons. Gallons. You've been leaving so much juice on the table. That's like, yeah. Yeah, a, and a really Tip. good like electric juicer, right? Because so they always say that you have the centrifugal juicers that just like spin shit really fast. It gets kind of like a fine grater, right? Those are, the, those are the louder shit ones. And then you have your cold press uh, or your masticating, which just means to chew, right? Your masticating juicers. Mm. Uh, so it works it's always, just like that hand press basically. But so it works. There's basically like a little – so that's what I got because that's because they're, they're quieter and they and they tend to do – they tend to be more expensive. Um, and, they, and the higher range is like way more expensive. Um, but they have like decent mid-range ones, right? But they're still more expensive than the centrifugal juicers. But they're quieter. They make less of a mess, and and they're called cold. So yeah, cold press and masticating just mean the same thing. Um, but they basically just had this like big screw, right? Mm -hmm. Like a like an mm -hmm. is it impeller the word I think maybe I don't know. But they had this like big screw that just like turns and kind of like and it turns through a tube, right? So that the yep, just the vegetables and fruit things. come in and they just get kind of crushed against the side by this, and the screw just like is forcing it down an ever like steeper mm -hmm. more intense thing and then it kind of so basically by, by the time you get to the end of that screw you just like squeeze you've like mashed it up and squeezed all the juice out and then just kind of like dry shit falls out of the other side uh it's very like it's very effective um and, and it's, it's one of those things it's like every just every once in a while like celery like there's no way to juice a celery Right, and, <laughs> unless you have a juicer, there's you can't. There's no other way to do it. So if you want to like have juices things, for things, yeah, most, most things, things are really very hard to juice. Like an apple, you can't juice an apple. Mm -hmm. You know, like like with your hands, right? You need a mm -hmm. you need one yeah. of these things. And so if you're if you're into like interesting drinks at all, or even just like because you can use them for other food stuffs, right? But if you're into drinks, whether it's cocktails or mocktails or just just having like tasty beverages, home, you know? so, yeah. yeah, like being able to juice a random item is just really. <laughs> useful for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so I highly recommend getting some, getting something like that. The, the, the one that, that that Ninja No Clog or whatever, it's like a pretty narrow profile. Um, it's like I don't know five inches wide, so you can kind of like slot it in mm -hmm. to some oh, space. You know, it's just yeah. not it's just not that big, and and you can't like you can only have to like cut things into two inch cubes to put it. Like there are some of the like the bigger juices you can get, you can just like throw a whole fucking orange in there, you know. <laughs> so like you you still have to do prep on this thing, but that was yeah a, sure. To me, that was a fair, you know, trade for having a pretty small yeah. space. But like, you just then hit the button and it just starts going. It's not and again, it's not very loud until stuff gets in there, and, and then it might be squeaky or, or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's I think that's been in terms of like things I'm consuming that take up mind space. It would be this ginger, that's a good one. ginger stuff coming out of this juicer. So yeah, Seth would be very nice. Well, I don't, I don't have any. I really haven't been drinking ever since weed became legal. 
uh, yeah, me in either. Missouri. So, so I've mostly been partaking in like uh, weed gummies and stuff like that when I want to when I want to chill out. As far as as far as books, the most recent book I read was a book on UFOs by mm, yeah. by Leslie Keen, uh, who's a, the journalist who uh, broke the New York Times story back in 2017 about the Navy videos. Um, which apparently had been leaked a long time before that, but but the release of her article in 2017 caused then the Navy to come out and authenticate the videos. And they're like, yeah, those are actually real and we don't know what the hell is going on in these mm. videos. Um, which I think it was back in June, there was that guy, David Grush, who was a high-level military, or, uh, military intelligence person who came out and did an interview about the U.S. government with alien spacecraft and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I... It was such a wild fucking interview that I was like, "All right, this I'm dude." I need some more. I was like, "I got, I got, I got to look into this because, like, this dude is uh, he. He, bas- he basically like sacrificed his career. He resigned and became a whistleblower, and and is a, he entered under whistleblower protections and stuff. And his whole job was he was asked by Congress to investigate these questions of like, what does the U.S. government know about UAPs, UFOs, whatever. Um, the idea being that there's probably some kind of like longstanding fragmented knowledge in various departments about all this stuff and nobody really knows what the hell is going on. There's no centralized hmm. plan. Uh, so that was his job and then he became a whistleblower and did this interview, uh, which I'd recommend people watch because it's, it's just it's, crazy. It's just crazy, yeah. Um, but like in an interesting way. So yeah, so after I saw that, I kind of went down that rabbit hole of like trying to figure out what the hell – like is this is this legit – and I got so I got the book UFOs by uh, Leslie Keen, which is it's it's all firsthand accounts from uh, like generals, high ranking military people, pilots, stuff like that, with like corroborated uh, data and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so so I, I read through that. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, where I kind of landed after reading that was like, okay, there are definitely a lot of things flying around in the sky, behaving in ways that nobody can really explain and and it's been corroborated on like radar eyewitness accounts multiple sightings by multiple people of the same events you know all that stuff um beyond that there's no other real like info mm-hmm. of, like about what these things which is why they're you they're ufos or you, yeah. like, they're unidentified right like by nature because yeah, there are but two questions I, right one is is this happening actually it's like are these unidentified things being seen right and are they right. like not just people thinking they're seeing things or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. That's question right. number one. And then question number two is if like those are being seen, is what are those? And I think the thing that we've now seen conclusively is that there are things happening that nobody has good explanations for. The thing that we don't know is because we don't have good explanations for is what they are, right? Yeah. And so so what this what this guy, David Grush, was alleging in his interview is that we actually there are people who do know what they are, but or some of them. Anyway. Or some of them, yeah, and it's it's so uh, so top secret and so buried and so it's almost like a you know, like remember the Manhattan Project where it was like super siloed pieces of information, people working on different things and stuff. Where it's like that, but it's been going on for so long that most of the information is unknown to most people, and mm-hmm. uh, even to a point where it's on such like a need to know basis that even like members of Congress would be like, hey, we want info about this. And then the Department of Defense is like, nah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, that's kind of the extent To be of it. fair, so, given the people in Congress, I wouldn't share any information with them if I could help it either. Yeah. Well, know? I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely, I mean, learning about this has definitely made me think more about just kind of like how things are structured in our, uh, like in our government, because we have this weird thing where we've got, we've got elected uh, officials with term limits in some cases. Um, and they can, they can be voted out of office and all that stuff. And then you've got career bureaucrats who mm-hmm. go in there, you know, maybe in like their even, or even in the military, like when they're 18, they go to the military and then they become officers and they kind of move up the ranks and stuff. And, and they're embedded into these institutions for like 40 years. Yeah, right. Whole career, yeah. So you've got these like temporary employees, like the president. Right. <laughs> and then you've got people who are really entrenched in the system who know how to kind of maneuver it. And they can, they can, in many cases, if there's something that they don't want to happen, they can just stall long enough mm-hmm. that the person trying to get answers just eventually loses their well, and, and position. And to an extent, you, you need to be able to do that, right? Because if like the yeah, quote unquote leadership of a government that is voted in, that is very temporary, 
we're able to just, I mean, you see this with Elon Musk on Twitter is a very good example of the mm-hmm. consequences of this, right? If you bring in a complete idiot into these cases, which, yeah, surrounded by yes people, surrounded by do, yes people, which is a good yeah. description of our government, right? Um, yep. is, I mean, there's a whole <laughs> bunch of them. There's just like hundreds of idiots, right? Doing stuff. If they could just like make things happen. On a just get whatever information they needed with no resistance yep. or – Yeah, and cause any new law to go into place or be taken away or whatever, right? Um, like, cause, And they're already doing that to the extent that they can. It's just that these existing infrastructure prevents it from being as fast, fast, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, because the sheer amount of chaos that unfolds when just everything is the subject of random people's whims, right, is way too high. So a lot of what these institutions do, like, like Seth, like you said, the, the bureaucratic sort of – Elements, which makes up most of the government. Like most of the government is not elected people, right? It's hired people yep. ma'am, who are doing yep. it as a career. Uh, and and they still, to an extent, are at the whims of their elected bosses, right? But the stuff that's the most stable, like the military, right? These kind of institutions, like part of why they're so stable is because they've managed to separate themselves pretty successfully from the whims of yep. – these randos, right? Because like you yeah. can't you can't trust randomly elected people, right? Uh, to like yeah, they're not elected on merit. Yeah, they're not right? elected like, on merit. They don't know anything. You can't trust them to to, hold, to to keep a secret, as we've seen with Trump, right? You can't trust them to do, and you can't trust them to like to evaluate evidence. And you can't trust them to like, given this piece of information, like do the right thing with it. You know, right? Like, you just can't yeah, trust them. And their stuff. motivations are different, right? Like their their motivations are political power gain and re-election, right? And yeah. it's not, so they're not necessarily going to be doing things with that information that is useful or helpful to the public at large, or even like in the interest. It's kind of like, you know, imagine if if every four or eight years, you suddenly had a new boss with completely unpredictable credentials. Yeah, <laughs> which does happen then, in some companies, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so what you would do is, is you you would kind of build up your own sort of um, hierarchy and power structures and ways to insulate yourself and make it hard for for that person to kind of uh, fuck around and and mess with the things that you have going on, yeah. right? So, which isn't so to have, like, say this- that these like entities are also like serving in the best interest of the public and all that kind of stuff, right? It's just to say that they have these they have to have built in these ways of mitigating how much they actually have to answer to the chaotic mm-hmm. leadership that. Uh, surrounds them. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that to me, one of the most interesting things about reading up on the UFO stuff isn't actually necessarily about the UFOs because like we've, we've all been hearing about UFOs for our entire lives, Mm -hmm. right? Like sightings and abductions and whatever else. And it's, you know, it's often like branded as, yeah, yeah, right. You know, uh, this person's crazy or whatever, which I'm, I'm beginning to lessen, like think less and less that that's actually the case. I think, I think these are real things that are happening and yeah, there's still a lot of people. Yeah, and there's a lot of people who actually do have mental health issues who jump onto the the bandwagon of it because one of the things that is driving me insane is anytime I want to learn stuff about like a, a specific UFO sighting or or whatever, um, there'll be there'll be a bunch of factual information in there of like here's what it looked like on radar, here's like this eyewitness account, this eyewitness account, and then and then the speculation starts. And it just completely goes oh, off the rails, yep. right? Yeah. Like people talk about like interdimensional time travelers or, or whatever. And it's like, yeah, there's no, there's no reason to go there. All you, all you can say is, wow, that was crazy. Look at that thing. Yeah. Right. Weird, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, but learning about all this stuff has definitely been very interesting in terms of thinking about like, about all the why questions. Like why, like why would it be the case that it would be hard for an elected official to get answers about something like this? Right. Mm-hmm. And it's it's because like what we just talked about of like once you think through all the incentives of of the stack of of uh, hierarchies within like the military or whatever and how people would want to operate as a career person underneath an, a, mm-hmm. an elected office, then it starts to get really interesting really fast. But yeah, definitely read that book. It's, it's worth a read. Uh, it's called UFOs by Leslie Keen. Uh, you guys want to get to the next question? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Captain Jazz asks – what are some of the biggest takeaways from specifically the launch and release of Levelhead? Given those lessons learned, how has the team implemented those into the launch of Crashlands 2 without giving away any NDA info, of course? I think uh, the biggest one, which we've, I think we've kind of variously talked about a little bit, um, is actually just the idea that 
we still, even though even though we knew that you had to make a game that people wanted, you know, we still did believe that having a really good game that people just that people who played loved would be sufficient, right? Um, and to an extent, it was as in like it was sufficient for us to get funding from uh, mm -hmm. our various business partners, right, and that kind of stuff, so that so that we could pay for the game, right? But it wasn't sufficient for us to actually like create the audience that we what that we were expecting because I, I still to this day think level head is just one of the best games out there like i think it's just really well done top to bottom um and it's occupying a niche that there's just not very much out there right which is which is actually the, the problem right mm -hmm. is uh and, and so i think there was it's like the kind of the biggest thing i think was just the fact that we did crash lands 2 at all is what, what kind of a, like yeah. a lesson learned from level head right where we said yeah, but before that, we were like, oh, like we love the idea that every time we make a game, we just get to do something completely different, you know, learn new things, try a new genre. And we had this like practice of like, going to genres we didn't even like to see if we could use the fact that we didn't like it to like to to interesting new. Yeah, to do something interesting and new. And and we kind of like gave we, we kind of joined the the chorus of other people giving other studios shit for just like working on their franchise product projects, right? <laughs> like making their next Diablo, making their next Overwatch, making their next whatever, right? Just ke continuing to to kick out the next item in the franchise. And and then we really just saw firsthand. Yeah, what can happen if you what can if, happen if you if you deviate too far from what people have come to like yeah, about is, what you've made. <laughs> and like and it, yeah, and like and I, you know, I get it as a on the consumer side, I, I get like we keep seeing the same movies coming out and like, you know, we keep seeing the same IP get exploited, right? And and I get as a consumer, I completely understand why that's annoying because you're like, I want new stuff. But I also know from a creator side that actually people don't want new stuff. That's actually mm -hmm. not true. Like we 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 think that we want new stuff, right? But there's a reason why, because like it is in the end the people who are watching this stuff, right? Like who then end up dictating kind of if people want to see it or not, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it just is the case that like. It just truly is extremely risky to do a new thing. Now, on the other hand, if you're an enormous company with infinite resources, I don't think you have as much of an excuse for not trying new stuff, right? Because like you can afford the risk. But at our scale, uh, we that was a kind of the big realization. We were just like, if we if we hadn't gotten those business dealings that we that we had with Levelhead, um, that would have been the end of the studio. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, we can't. At this point, we now like our salaries are coming out of it. Our spouses' salaries are largely coming out of it. We have people we employ who depend on us financially, right? Like things change enough from the the earlier days where we're like, we just we we actually have to do the smart business move here, um, which also was something we wanted to do. So it worked out nicely, right? Um, yeah, I think but, I think to that point, the way I put it is that um, I think before the idea of doing a, something like a series or a sequel or kind of exploring the same space multiple times uh, over a career or whatever else seemed like it would be really like, kind of boring and I didn't really mm -hmm. get the appeal. Um, and I do think after, or like in starting Crashlands 2, because of how we approached it from a sequel standpoint, which is like a true sequel, it's a capital S to me. Yeah, which is not like, the same game, just with different stuff, but like... Exactly. But yeah. I genuinely sort of, we had to rebuild the studio to do it. We had to rebuild all of the ways we work top to bottom to be able to produce this game means that it basically was this realization like, you know, most people who create stuff never even get to have a thing that does well, not even one. Right. And so it almost felt like, um, it's okay to back, be the crash land studio. You know? It is, but also, yeah. but also like there's a, there was a weird hubris sort of a thing, if that makes sense, where it's like yeah. you had, like, if you, you somehow managed after, you know, three years of struggling, basically to like, crank out something that a lot of people really liked and then to sort of also suddenly be like well, let's just make something completely different now because like, i can do better i can do better totally different yeah, yeah. i don't know there's there's some weird aspect of it where i was like it's there's nothing wrong with finding your thing it's like people who sing in a genre you know what i mean it's like mm -hmm. that's that's kind of yeah. the way that there's people an, want to listen to music too there's so. an ego that we tend to have as indie developers that we've been working to try mm -hmm. to try to shake off over the years, right? Which is like, like you're saying, it's the idea that that you're 
you're here because you're you're super passionate about making games in the, but in like in a in a special way that's mm-hmm. a different kind of passion than the AAA developers have or whatever. Uh, and then and like everything that you do has to like reinforce to yourself that you are that kind of a person that you kind of like hold yourself up to be, which means like you're not going to go creatively bankrupt and make a sequel. Right. You're right, always right. going to do something totally new because because you're a brilliant genius. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, <laughs> uh, yeah, really there's some like, weird undertone, right? It's yeah. Like, and you can and you can find a million new things to do in a sequel while also like, you know, giving your your players something that they're really excited about and that they want. I mean, it, it kind of makes me think of um, when I heard that the uh, FTL studio was making a new game. I was like, fuck yes, mm-hmm. FTL 2. It wasn't FTL 2. Yep. Uh, it was Into the Breach. Totally different game. Mm-hmm. Which was a cool game, but kind of like level head, right? There's like, there's like, there's a community of people who fucking love it. And it, like, I'm pretty sure it did it's well cool. enough, yeah. right? It did pretty well. But it didn't do it nearly didn't. as well as FTL or nearly as well as an FTL sequel would have done, right? Yeah. And also most of the audience for that studio was from FTL. Exactly. And they did not carry over in the same way that our Crashlands audience did not carry over to level it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I, would I would have dropped like sixty bucks for an FTL two? Yes, yeah, but I I dropped zero dollars on Into the Breach. I bought it because I was just because <laughs> I, I actually so like I I'm one it, of those yeah. yeah I'm one of those people who bought it because I trusted the studio and I was like what what is this thing that they made right and all at the same time being bummed that it was not FTL two FTL two right? <laughs> uh, but but I still was like I'm gonna I'll give this a shot you know I know like it was a cool concept it just wasn't the kind of game that I that I was into so I didn't play it for very long right. Um, but it, like it is like it was still the goodwill that I had towards the studio from their prior completely different game, and there's there, there's a subset of people who will do. There's a subset of our players who like who have played all of our stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But it is a, it's a tiny small subset. Yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah. So I think that was the big one for me. It was sort of like recognize when you you actually have found an avenue through which to do your creative work that not only manages to hit the targets that you want in terms of you know like Crashlands is the kind of game that I want to play all the time is if there were a thousand of them, I would play all of them. It's that sort of thing. Right. And so to be able to make that experience for people is really special to me, right. To be able to do that. And so it's sort of this realization looking backwards and like, that was kind of a weird, <laughs> it was a weird response to be like, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm not we were gonna, young. I was you young. Know, we didn't know. Yeah. yeah I think <laughs> but it is also funny too, because like, it actually worked out. Oh, in great. the end, it, like because of anyway, this is this is extreme survivorship bias, right? Um, and it's, it's always why you never look at what another studio did and say, oh, "I'll just kind of follow that model," right? Because uh, like we, we've mentioned before, like there were various points up to Crashland, original Crashlands launched, and then between Crashlands and Levelhead, where we just were almost toast. Um, that things just just went the right way, and we were fi- and we ended up being fine, right? Uh, but because of the fact that things ended up working out and we didn't do Crashlands 2 right after original Crashlands, we ended up spending basically the intervening four years, right? Like mm-hmm. learning how to manage and run a team, building up all of our infrastructure, rethinking how we do literally everything, building, and we threw away several partially constructed games in between mm-hmm. before we started Levelhead. And, and we're kind of, you know, we just kind of spun our wheels. We learned new stuff. And then we made Levelhead as a completely different thing that pushed us in all kinds of new and delightful ways. We built all this web infrastructure specifically mm-hmm. for Levelhead, right, that we get to keep on reusing today. Even the, the internal game tooling approach came from yep. Levelhead, which is like basically the game tooling to build Crashlands as a uh, yeah, all content lives design in the game. perspective yep. is all in the game. So and it's it's well done. It's not like shitty UIs and stuff. It's there's you know, there's paint bucket tools, there's eyedroppers, there's all sorts of just like cool stuff going on. It's <laughs> yeah, so it's like, fun to work it's with. It's professional software top to bottom, right? Yeah. 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 And that was all stuff that we like if because if we had made Crashlands 2 right out of the gate, we would have had a game out much sooner than we otherwise Certainly. did. Right. Probably just a couple of years after original Crashlands is when Crashlands 2 would have come out, right? But it would have basically been Crashlands. Yeah. Well, I think it's things like I, it's not that I yeah, but I think that that doing something else right after uh, a game, your like a game launches. Not necessarily something so different that you're like, I don't know if there's even an audience for it. That that to me was like the yeah. business case question there. But like doing a different game for a while or going and exploring some new tech, I think is good because then it means that when you come back to do, say the next iteration of your flagship thing, we should in our cases, Crashlands, you have just some, uh, you've gathered some other stuff yep. sort of from the fringes, right? 
Um, and so it may well be that, you know, after Crashlands 2, that we want to make, I don't know, something, some other kind of thing. Like, I still personally want to tap into some multiplayer stuff and figure some of that out. But I wouldn't try to do that on the scale of Crashlands 2 or Levelhead, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So basically do a smaller scale one that's for cutting your teeth on something else so that you get a bunch of new skills and then turn back around and yeah. apply those to and but the, but then the probably the business idea though that case would be would we would say like well if we if we want to basically push multiplayer then we we would say, and like figure out how to like do that then if Crashlands two was successful enough that we have like a ten year runway if we're mm-hmm. that lucky right then we'll just say okay we can just make whatever because it doesn't have to be commercially viable we can we can focus on what we want to learn and what would be fun to do right. But if Crashlands 2 doesn't kick out a long enough runway for us to make a random thing to learn multiplayer and then and then all and then the Crashlands 3 or whatever to actually fund the studio, then that dramatically constrains our yes. options for what that thing looks like. Because that because now it kind of like needs to be a Crashlands game, probably, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but but scaled down to focus on multiplayer or something. Um, Which may also be the thing to do, sort of regardless, right? Because that'd be kind of fun. But yeah. Like- well, and it also lets us kind of remove a whole bunch of other questions that we otherwise would have and mm-hmm. take the lessons learned into like a full scale, you know, Crashlands 3 yeah. multiplayer or whatever. Yeah. 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 So I think there's there's a lot of those kinds of underpinning things there. I, and then to me, to Adam's point also, just kind of the, the, the increasing importance of business deals, both as the scale of your studio goes up, right? Because the, basically the amount of risk that you're shouldering in terms of like how many people depend on you goes up. So having business deals in place that secure parts of that just frankly is a fucking load off mentally. Like it frees you up to just be able to just go make your stuff without having to be like, oh God, is there 12 people going to be destitute in six months? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's not fucking fun. To yeah, be- and, or knowing that you can hire some, because like so we brought Carl on mm-hmm. from like sort of half-time-ish to now full-time, right? And it was one of those things where like, because our runway is long enough, we're just like, this doesn't really increase our risk to the studio, mm-hmm. right? And we can definitely, we'll definitely be needing a lot more QA resources as we get into the next phase mm-hmm. of the game. So being in that position where we know we can just, we can do that um, is huge, increasingly important. And especially as we've gotten used to not like for each one of us, not having to deal with certain aspects of the studio that we just yeah. have to deal with, you know, like, <laughs> I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to, to <laughs> dealing with all of that shit that we now have people whose job it is to take care of that stuff, you know? Uh, uh-huh. and, and that's that's a big part of it too, right? It's like, because in principle, we could downscale if we needed to, right? But like, that means we have to fire people, which sucks, mm-hmm. right? And that would also mean that we have to do a bunch of stuff that we didn't have to do for a long time that we're not going to be bad at and not, and also it's going to slow down the next thing that we're trying to do because yeah. we can no longer spend the time on the stuff that we're good at, right? Uh, yeah. So it's, so it's it just everything bad for – It'd just be bad all around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. And I think the, the last one is that like in in the aftermath of any release, you make up stories about why it went well or poorly. Mm-hmm. But then the longer time elapses between that launch and where you are now, the stories will change and sometimes invert. Right. And so what I mean by that is after the launch, there were a few comments that had stuck with me about the art in Levelhead. So one was we had a uh, business partner who made an offhand comment about the game looking retro. Yeah. Which hit me in a particular way. Cause I was like, yeah, I we were know. like, that's dumb. That's like, this is not what retro is, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the other was maybe like one or two players who were like, why is the base robot gray or something? Right. And there's these pieces where you start, depending on what your role is in the project and, you know, how big the team is, of course, where you start feeling like maybe you made some dumb calls about what to do, right? Like meta. Yeah, like, if only I had not made Jerry Team Gray, I would have, <laughs> exactly. would have succeeded. <laughs> which, which, yeah, when you state it back, you know, with a bit more distance, it doesn't feel particularly sane to say. Um, or saying like, oh, it's because the game is, you know, 2D art that it didn't do well when, like, most platformers that do really well are 2D. <laughs> it's kind of the same fucking thing. Uh, there's a lot of stories that you'll tell yourself about. And then, and then the success of the original Crashlands, you know, we've, we've had similar stories uh, that over time, you're like, maybe that had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so I think yep. it's, it's, for me, I think, promoted more slowness in responding emotionally to these things. Does that make sense? but also being much more keen on just sort of just whatever the hard facts are that we have available. So like Crashlands wishlist numbers are more than, you know, like 15 times what level heads were when level had launched. 
you know, we are just like two months, three a months into everything on. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, and then like, you know, the, the accidental leak in China thing with the, with the trailer that blew up there. So there's, there's enough hard facts around that I'm not so worried about stuff or specifics this time, if that makes sense. And I think- Yeah, although honestly, if the game doesn't do well, it's probably because you drew Flux wrong slightly, I you would know. think. Yep, 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 100%. So, you know. Because she is purple instead of blue. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's because yeah. she has elbows and knees now. I fucked it up. Oh, yeah. Nobody that's was. A, yeah. That's a lack of elbows and knees was sort of the killer feature of the original <laughs> Crash Lens. Yeah. Well, so, and to bring it back to the, to the UFO thing, right? Like, there's this discomfort that we and people in general have, we all have, with just being like, I don't know. I don't know. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's so like with the UFO stuff, those will say, like, there were actually, if you break it down, there's actually two problems, which is are, are things happening? And then, can we figure out what they are, right? And what we what we do have enough evidence for is to say, yeah, some stuff is happening. Mm-hmm. But we don't we don't have enough evidence to even even know how many different kinds of things are happening. We just know a bunch of stuff is happening that falls under mm-hmm. this this general umbrella that doesn't mean they're the same thing, right? What we don't have though is anything that tells us what those what are and something that we can have confidence about, right? And it's the same deal when you're like looking back at how your game went, um, where so this is, it's the idea of like the just so story, right? Where you just like come up with a neat little story that like that just ties it all together and it, and it feels right, right? Mm-hmm. But just because it feels right doesn't mean it actually is, yeah. What and happened, I think the, right? The more time passes, the more you can easily make up some other story that also perfectly fits, and then you're like, well, does that? Yeah. Mean that? But also, the, <laughs> and also the more solidified you can get, because like, because what a lot of people yeah. do is like, is they'll come up with their story. And this is basically like what any retrospective talk that tries to give takeaways will do, right? Is they'll put together their neat little story that they'll then that the person who does construct it just actually believes is the truth, right? And then everything starts to fit and slot right into that. Things get discarded that don't fit as easily, mm-hmm. right? And that kind of becomes like, yeah, this is why. This is the story, right? When the reality is never clean enough. It's just never clean enough. Um, except for these just extreme rare cases, right? Where it's like, oh, yeah, ambiguously, so- this game wasn't being played by anybody. This one YouTuber picked it up. Nobody else yep. made any videos. We can't find any evidence anybody was doing anything. Yep. And then this and person it did it. And a million yeah. people saw it. And then all of a sudden the next, like that same day, like the game exploded, right? Like, and even then, there are still some question marks because it's because it's not possible to actually get the info you would need to conclusively say for sure, right? It's just that at that point, it's not very likely, right? But that is the extreme outlier. Almost nothing is that clean, and even when it's that clean, there's still uncertainty, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot, so much of what we've had to do is just like is truly just accept that we have to end up with a collection of possible explanations where we don't get to know which one of them is true. Mm-hmm. And they then we have, have a to little basically shard of something in them that you're like, this seems right. Yeah. And then we, we just have to use our them. own reasoning to basically say, okay, like, given that this happened here, are the possible explanations, uh, then given that we don't know which one of these is the explanation, mm-hmm. if we assume all of them are true, even though they're contradictory, right? But if you assume all of them are true, then what does that mean we would need to do mm-hmm. as a consequence? Because we can't just pick one, right? We just have to say like, any of these could be true, though. So we have to we have to act as if any one of those things are the actual explanation, mm-hmm. which is hard to do. You just never know. Yeah, we, we had talked a while back about uh, around when we kind of first started the studio and we were doing a lot of reading of like postmortems mm-hmm. that people would post on Gam- Gama Sutra at the time, which is yeah. now something else. Game developer. Game, Game developer. Game developer. Com. Dot com, something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and we would read these postmortems and, you know, when we were first starting, we would kind of take them as truth. Right, where it's like, oh yeah, like this person did this and this happened, right? But then as we released more and more games and got deeper into all of the technicals of how how do you run a studio, how do you think about your pipelines, blah, blah, blah. And we would see more and more of these postmortems where we could start to see the cracks mm-hmm. where somebody would say, you know, we did A and then B happened. And we're like, yeah, but a thousand other studios did A and B didn't happen. So yeah. well, that's where the survivorship <laughs> bias comes in, right? Is, right. Yeah. yeah. So you, you start to get a sense of like these these anecdotes, like postmortems are anecdotes. And and you would need a lot of them to actually make any kind of sense, but also recognize the bias in the sample. Yeah. Of, mm-hmm. You um, also need to know about what you're not hearing about, right? And mm-hmm. you definitionally cannot. Part. 
So you have to actually infer that anytime you're like reading about reading one of these stories, you have to then ask yourself, okay, what stories am I not hearing though that mm-hmm. relate to this? And are those likely to also be occurring? Um, and the answer is almost 100% of the time, yes. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of when people talk about uh, headlines that have the word may in them, just mm-hmm. always in your mind, append not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, this new drug may cure cancer. Just re- in your mind, just replace it with may not cure cancer <laughs> because mm-hmm. that is what may means, yeah. right? It's. Mm-hmm. May or may not. It could, but also it. Yeah. If you're feeling generous, <laughs> if you're feeling generous, you can replace it with may or may not. But if you're trying to keep yourself from getting bamboozled, yeah, replace every may with may not. It doesn't even and change. could with could not. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yeah. It, it's and it is like the case. Like I, the, I now anytime I see any headline, if it's making any kind of a claim whatsoever, I'm like, this is definitely not true. No. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> It's just not true. Yeah. It's not going to be true <laughs> until I've seen the same headline twenty times, and even then. It probably still isn't true, you know, until because it might yeah, it might just be twenty news articles just copy pasting the original article. Yeah, because that's yeah, actually that's how this stuff works. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Some real tricky so, business. Seth, did you have anything from that basically aftermath window of uh, Love Ahead's launch and going through Game Pass mm-hmm. and all that that left a lesson for you? On the yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was actually kind of a, a slight backtracking on our try to be on as many platforms as possible. Yes, yeah. strategy. Um, which honestly, like that strategy works really well when you are on, when you're just on platforms that give you a lot of control over your deployments yes. and your scheduling and stuff. It's basically like Steam, Steam and mobile. And yeah, mobile yep. Steam and mobile. Yeah. Once you get consoles in the mix, they have, they have cert processes where you can't just deploy a patch straight to your players. And even iOS no is a little question marky. Yeah. yeah I, iOS was our first little flavor, a little taste of like having a middleman mm-hmm. review what you're about to deploy and then tell you no, right? Um, but they are pretty fast about it, but the consoles are not quite as fast, right? And in some cases, it can be weeks of, mm-hmm. of time where like you say, oh, well, we got a small bug fix. We mm-hmm. want to send this out. And then you, you send it. And then two weeks later, somebody comes back and they're like, no. And yeah. in some cases, they would say no because of something that was previously approved, mm-hmm. And didn't change at all. It's and then a fickle just, process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so so that and and that that kind of made me think about like the the cost benefit of of maintenance, right? Like the yeah, more yeah, the more sure. platforms you're on, uh, the more you have to stay on top of all of the certification guidelines and release guidelines for those platforms. And whenever they release a patch for their OS or something, you've got to patch your game. Well, if you put it onto a store or a platform that for maybe maybe it's a popular platform, but it doesn't like your game doesn't do well there, mm-hmm. or maybe it's an, a new storefront that just doesn't have that many customers, whatever it is. But if you're, if your game is selling like three copies a month on that platform or three copies a year, right. Mm-hmm. Then you're just, you're just constantly in this like mental battle of like, Oh yeah, they just did something that breaks my game, but also like, it's actually more costly for your game to be out than it is for it. Yeah. You, you, I mean, like it, it, you are not in a place where you ha- broke even at the launch nor where the continued like continued money trickling in from there is going to amount to even doing like a fucking OS based update for this yeah. game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's yeah, that switched our model from to the same one we have there. Cause like the studio, we kind of switched from originally like after crash we were like, okay, now we have to scale so we can make bigger stuff. And then we over time changed our way of thinking to think about scalability rather than actually scaling, right? And I think for platforms it was the same deal where where it's not that we Mm-hmm. We no longer feel like we need to launch on all the platforms at once or at all, right? It's that we need to be able to because being able to is what allows us to secure business deals, make sure whatever platform is the hot platform of this three-year stretch, you know, that we can get on that one. Um, mm-hmm. That basically, it gives us the maximum flexibility to take advantage of like what the market looks like, but that we no longer feel like we also just have to be on all of the platforms, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then you see stuff like uh, like Baldur's Gate came out. You know, they launched on Steam. It was in Steam Early Access only for mm-hmm. years, right? And uh, now it's coming out on consoles. I think this in the coming weeks or even this week. Um, and that's it, right? Like they didn't they didn't try to figure out how to launch it on like Switch. GOG and itch.io and Switch and you know like all these other things. Um, and and it's it's fine. And again, like that's a huge outlier. But just the idea that like yeah. that 
to be successful, your game needs to be on everything. It's just not, it's not true. Well, actually, well, it's actually, it those are, they're yeah. kind of unrelated actually, right? Because mm -hmm. be, being able to be on everything can enable you to be successful under the other right set of circumstances, right? Right. Uh, and that includes- Unless you capitalize on, on opportunities. Yeah, exactly. You know? There needs to be yeah. something you're actually capitalizing on, which which could be the platform. Like, a, a, So Steam, I think, is probably the best example because it's, it's still today the only platform I think you can just kind of create your own success on. Uh, but it's because they have such good algorithmic discovery mechanisms, right? And it is still hard as shit. So it's like, don't get me wrong about that, right? But we actually do have, there's but a sense of like- it's possible. It's possible you know I mean? for us yeah. to like, to, for us to cause the levers to, or the gears to turn, you know? And and so what that means is that Steam is one of those like, yeah, it's one of those platforms that like, generally you should just be on probably if you, if like, if you have a game that can be successful anywhere, mm -hmm. it's probably worth putting on Steam, right? Um, otherwise yes. you're, you're leaving stuff out. But that's, and so there's some, and every once in a while there's a platform that comes up or that changes or whatever that then becomes kind of like that, right? Because like mobile used to be like that where, uh, and especially on on Google Play because they also had and have good algorithmic discovery. It's just they're so focused on free to play that it doesn't you Should can't compete, right? Yeah. right. Um, but for our time, you kind of could, right? You could actually like raise up those charts. So again, it was like if you can make it your game work on mobile at that Why time, not? you just do it because your market gets so much bigger and like you mm -hmm. actually can drive your own success. And then today, like for us as a studio, we still want to make it so that because we now now have now having worked on the platforms and knowing just how f rapidly these platforms change and all the consoles dabble in mobile periodically, like you know, mm -hmm. being able to go across form factors and being able to have games that don't require fuckloads of compute resources and stuff mm -hmm. makes it's us really useful. adaptable. It just yeah, makes us super useful. adaptable. But that doesn't mean that we actually then do have to because I think an example of. Crashlands 2 is that at the currently we're not planning on a Switch release for Crashlands 2, right? And it's basically because like the Switch is an old piece of hardware, and that mm -hmm. store you can't you can't create your own success in that store because they don't have the same kind of algorithmic curation mm -hmm. power that other stores do. So there's tons of games coming out all the time. There's just no way to get yours seen. And so like you take that combination of things, and it's just like uh, and, and it's so costly to develop for because they're weird hardware. It's yeah. cool hardware, right? Because of the the split controller. The split and controller to, and like and they, yeah. they they put the buttons in different places, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's, and like and it's just it's a weird platform to develop for and it's extremely hardware constrained from a compute standpoint, mm -hmm. right? And so that was one of those decisions we had to make a little while ago was like, if we want to be able to get the game on Switch, the game has to, we have to operate within some serious mm -hmm. limitations, some serious constraints. And so we had to choose like, do we go ahead really early and say, we're just not even going to try because mm -hmm. we don't think operating those constraints is worth it, right? And for, in the past, we just would always say, we just got to make that work, like just whatever it is, it. right? Yep. And and this time we're trying to, we're trying to more carefully evaluate, like we still in... We don't want to be so far away from like what Switch is that if for some if something changes in that market, we still could. We, we still, still could. can, yeah. but it, because of all, in other words, we have all the tool, all the tooling such that we can go do all the work that's required. Yeah, and we Switch know what would be required, right? Yes, yeah. but we're not planning on it because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and, and so we're kind of like keeping it where if we have to, it's going to be costly, but we could, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where in the past we would say we just already have to know it's going to work. It's going to be right? costly, and we must. Yeah, <laughs> we must. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're ready for it. And also, I think I think there's a new switch coming. Maybe I feel like, like we've been hearing this for so long that I don't know. Been here for so long, and that's not my primary concern. The reality is like optimization is optimization. You can just you know. If you got enough engineering time, you could figure some shit out. My concern yeah. is the storefront being yeah, the storefront it's is still well, garbage. Storefront and form factor, you know, and other stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so. yeah, I don't think I don't think Nintendo can help themselves. Even if they do release like the Switch Two, they're going to do something weird with the controls. They can't. They can't make them. They can't not. So there's going to be like a fucking touch screen on it or something that we have to adapt. You know, who knows what's going to be on there, but. There's going to be a, a there will be a form factor change. It does definitely. something. I don't know what that is. I love. Yeah, I mean, I love their weird stuff, but yeah, it's always very strange. But, yeah. uh, and also, they've got like that's also a good example of the idea of like instead of doing a sequel, just doing something completely new and different, yeah. right? Yeah. Where like Nintendo had their reputation with like almost like Windows, where they would do like a good Every a other. good product launch and then a bad one and then a good one and a bad one right every other mm -hmm. uh yeah like if you're going to change lots of things you you run the risk of changing the wrong things mm -hmm. every now and then right so that's okay well i think we probably got to wrap there that's all the time we have 
Uh, we'd like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Sampa DaCosta, for putting the podcast together. And thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, just go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the Discord, a way for you to donate, and links to the archives. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.